As I was introduced to many of you, I, for, I felt a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Especially thank you to Reverend Gail Brown for this invitation and my pastor, Reverend Leroy Franklin, who is in the back there. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I also see a fellow preacher, Reverend Robert Marks. Thank you so much for, for being here. Let me impart these words on you for a few minutes, and they do come from the gospel reading this morning. A challenge to you this morning from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through his word. A challenge to acknowledge God's authority. A challenge to acknowledge God's authority. This was a very, very busy time for Jesus. He had just entered Jerusalem for the last time. He had ascended. He had come in. He had cleared the temple. You could say that this was the height of Jesus Christ's ministry. Uh, imagine him riding in on a donkey. People throwing their cloaks, their, their clothes on the ground for him in homage. Imagine the, the palms that were laid before him and him riding in to the shouts of hallelujah, hallelujah. Many were expecting him to establish his kingdom on this earth. We finally got it. Jesus is going to establish his kingdom. He's going to overthrow the Roman government. And we Jews are going to be on top once again. All those times that we, we suffered, all those times that we were in captivity, yeah. only to be exiled, come back, and be under someone else's thumb. Mm -hmm. Imagine that. Mm -hmm. but, but it's going to be different this time because Jesus Christ is riding in. He is the Messiah. He is the prophet of God. And we finally going to overthrow the Romans. Well, there were some problems, though, with this. <laughs> the, the Pharisees sent their disciples and the Herodians to Jesus Christ to trap Jesus. Right then and there, there was a power struggle. Actually, throughout Jesus Christ's whole ministry, there was this power struggle between the religious leaders and Jesus and his disciples. After the Pharisees and their disciples and the Herodians stated their empty platitudes. You are certainly from God. You teach the truth. Can you see all the butter they're putting on the bread? <laughs> <laughs> After those platitudes, though, Jesus knowing their hearts, they asked Jesus if they should pay taxes to Caesar. Now, you have to realize this was a bigger question. You have to realize that taxes back then were probably as popular as taxes are now. <laughs> Amen. I should have been preaching this on April 15th. <laughs> However, this was the bigger picture. I could simplify this in saying that this is all about paying taxes. I, I, could, say, I could say that, yes, we should pay our taxes. And I'm saying this for the record. Yes, pay your taxes. <laughs> and Paul McLeod did not say the payment uh, to forego your taxes. But there's a bigger picture here. There's a bigger message than just paying your taxes. Even though we should pay our taxes, they tried to trap him. And on the surface, Jesus had one of two choices. He could say, yes, pay your taxes. And then, then they would say, then they would say, yeah, we got him. He's in line with the Roman government. He's a collaborator. <laughs> he is the one that has assimilated into the culture. And now we can pit him against the people. Or he could have said, no, do not pay your taxes. This is not a legitimate government. We are being oppressed. This, this area, this land is being occupied. And then that group would have said, ha, now we've got him. We can report this to the Romans, and we can have him eliminated. 
We can have him legally assassinated. Amen. 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 But there is a bigger question here. Jesus' answer, if we jump to the end, amazed them. Jesus said what he said, and all of a sudden, they did not have a reply. He, they were just amazed. Jesus said, yes, pay your taxes. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, and give to God what is God's. But they were amazed by this. Why were they amazed? Before he said that, though, he asked them a question. Whose image is on this coin? Whose head is on this coin? And of course they said Caesar. Then he said what he said. Pay your taxes, but give to God what is God's. What he did not ask and is implied and what amazed them was that he said, or he didn't say, what image is on you? What image is on this coin? If, if that image is on that coin, then that's who has authority over you. And you should give to that which has authority. What image is on you? If you have an image on you, you should give authority to whoever gave you that image and give yourself to that. What image is on us? What image is on us? You should go back to the Old Testament and in creation where it says that God created us, what? In, in the image of God. Image. To answer the question that I just asked, God's image is on you. If that is true, let's think about this. If that is true, God is the only one that has a right to tell you how to live. Amen. Amen. Think about that. Think about that. Out of all the people in your life, out of all the institutions that we have in our life, God is the only one that has a right to tell you how to live your life. Mm -hmm. How should we live our life? How should we live our life? In Matthew 22 and 37, Jesus said unto them, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. In other words, with everything that is within you, love the Lord. And that's how we are to bear God's image. There are some, though, who are in rebellion. Amen? Mm -hmm. There are some who, who go against the prince that do not want to obey God. But God loves us enough to give us enough rope <laughs> Why should we love the Lord with all of our heart and with all of our soul and with all of our mind? Let me give to you two today that you can take home. We should love the Lord with everything because, number one, he created us. Amen. As you leave the church today, look around at the flowers. Look around at the trees the birds in the air, the blue sky. Yeah. Breathe in God's air and think about what it took to create a living being and how much that took for God to do that. So for, for him to put his image on us. Imagine that. In Genesis 126, it says, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image after our likeness. You bear someone's image. Do you live that way? The second, we should love the Lord with everything because he loves us. John 3, 16 says, for this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish but will have eternal life. We should love the Lord because he created us. We should love the Lord because he loves us. He loved us enough to send his son to die for our sins. You can't get better love than that. We were sinking in sin, but Jesus came along, and if we trust him for the remission of our sins, 
we will have eternal life. Our challenge today is to acknowledge God's authority in every area of our lives. And let me close with this. There's a story of a stay of execution. Stuart Allstop discussed what it was like to live with incurable leukemia. The disease was temporarily arrested. During this time, the not too active Episcopalian and noted journalist discussed a number of variables with his physician. Finally, Alstott said, there is one variable you left out. What's that, he said? God. <laughs> the doctor and patient smiled, Alstott continued, I don't really believe in God, or at least I don't think I do, and I doubt if my doctor does, but I think we both had in the back of our minds the irrational notion that God might have something to do with what happened all the same. Praise be to God for his word. Amen. Amen.